Jenny Stiven, fascinating, fascinating woman. I love this conversation. Do you know what a fandom growth expert is? Intellectual property fandom growth expert. So these movie franchises, the very big ones that we all know, Marvel, Star Wars, Harry Potter, uh, James, uh, James Bond, uh, you know, Star Trek, they all have these large fan bases or their fandoms and connecting the fandoms, fandom base to the movie, to the franchise is a very, very difficult task. A lot of the uh, movie uh, production companies ignored it for a while, but not anymore. So she specializes in connecting the two, getting out to that base and having them get feedback on a particular, uh, you know, movie or episode or, or a, a series. It's a fascinating discussion on the relationship between fans and the art. Uh, we also talk about movie excuse me, about video games and the fandom that's been created there. But it's a fascinating discussion. Uh, I really, I, I, I knew very little about this and uh, now I know a lot more. And what, need, what does it take? And what happens to those trolls? And there's a certain entitlement to some of the fandom uh, base as well. But fascinating discussion on that and the relationship with discipline, by the way. Very, very interesting how Jenny makes that connection. Thanks for listening. Hi. I'm Joey Pins. People ask me, how did I lose 130 pounds? The quick answer is always discipline. I started my business, wasn't paying attention to my health, was eating too much, you know, drinking too much sweets. My daughter was born. Next thing I know, I'm pre-diabetic, I have hypertension. I knew something had to change. Discipline. I, like many of you, have faced many challenges in your career, in your family, in your life, in your faith. How did you attack them? How did you approach them? How did you solve them, hopefully? It all had to have some degree of discipline. I'm also asked, how did you found and start a tech business that lasted over 25 years? Discipline. I was committed to it, enjoyed technology, didn't enjoy some aspects of it, but knew it was necessary. Discipline. Our podcast mission, how do we use discipline to better ourselves and society? Join me, please, as I talk to interesting people and discuss how they use discipline in their family and their passion and their careers and how it helped them. Our podcast vision, growth through learning from others. Joey Pins Discipline Conversations. It will be light and serious. Join us, please. Thank you for consideration. Yes. Jenny Stiven, it's such such a pleasure. Thanks so much for uh, for spending your time with me. So, what exactly is an intellectual property fandom growth expert? <laughs> so, it comes from starting in sci-fi and fantasy and production and entertainment as a geek girl myself. Hmm. And so, what we do, and there's a couple of us in the industry right now, is that we protect that IP for both the owner, the studio, the author, but also for the fan. And we do audience development so that there's never any doubt on the fandom side that there's somebody paying attention, that they're hearing them, that they're spending the time. And from the studio or the owner side that we can develop their audience, we can grow their audience. And so what I do is I do that, you know, I have a pie chart that I cover what is normal for audience development in digital, but it's specific to fandom. So I go to where the fans are. Just the term fandom is, is a pretty new word, correct? It is and it isn't. So if you talk about sports, it's been around forever. Ah, if you sure. talk about music, it's been around for as long as rock and roll has been around. Or you could even say Beethoven and Mozart because they had mm. their fans. And I think... I was doing this for a panel. I think fandom, uh, in terms of what I do, really entered our pop culture movement in digital with X-Files. So you could say it started with Star Trek because that's really where the sci-fi, and again, I'm being very specific to my area, yeah. but Star Trek is probably the first, but in terms of digital, it's X-Files because we had the first Usenet groups. We had the first forums, the AOL chat rooms. 
that's where a TV show, as well as at that point, then Stargate and Star Trek, which vie for who really did the first website for their movies. Uh, that's where the growth of digital fandom really came in. Hmm. Yeah. And not to kind of, uh, well, I guess we can nerd out as we're both a couple of nerds, but uh, mm-hmm. the term <laughs> fan is short for fanatic, I believe. And we yeah. were talking about English soccer before we got on your Chelsea fan, yeah. and a, a city fan. And of course they don't use the word fan over there. They use supporter, right? We're, right. we're supporters. So I don't know, f- fans and kingdom makes fandom. I'm not quite, quite sure of the root, but it's, it's a fascinating source. It is. And it's, you know, and after the Liverpool disaster, that's when they changed from fan to supporter because they wanted to, they wanted, well, PR wise marketing, Uh. they wanted to delineate from those were fanatics that were violent and were supporters, which is great. And that was a very smart and that was a great way to do it. In my world for sci-fi for geeks, if you're at any Comic-Con, I mean, you know, 1973, you're at the L- Cortez down here, downtown in San Diego for the first, second or third Comic-Con, you were fans and people were talking about Star Trek fandom. So I think it was just a generic way to say, I'm a fan, but I'm part of this fandom. And there is a delineated, like a kingdom, there is a, (laughs) I hate to say, there is a boundary, Mm. but what we try to do is we try to say that those are fluid because you don't want to get into toxicity. You don't want to get into gatekeeping, which happens a lot. And that's, unfortunately, that's a huge part of my job Mm -hmm. is trying to bypass that leapfrog over it, ignore it. So as a kid, you watch Star Trek with your father and, uh, you know, as uh, my father didn't watch it, but I, my mother actually watched, but I I watched it too. But was that, so you say X-Files kind of created the first kind of online group, but they're the, Star Trek was very odd because it was only canceled after three seasons, but then it had this resurgence and demand in the, in right in the rollout in the not replay. And they had reruns. events and they, they had, had events. events. So a lot of what, so digital was X-Files and, and there's, you know, certainly we could talk about prior to that. There were certainly uh, forums on prodigy and CompuServe and early digital hmm. for other shows, but the one that really rooted and then grew and then spread to other shows was X-Files. What I believe is the beginning of the sci-fi geek fandom for TV shows, for films, not for books, but is Star Trek. And a lot of that is because of that. It had its one season or however many seasons it was. And then people watched it over and over and over and over again on reruns. And then they spread the word. And then they had meetings. And some of those first cosplay were Star Trek meeting. I mean, Renaissance Fair is first cosplay, but Mm. for geek areas, for sci-fi, it's Star Trek. And so these guys were meeting. I mean, I was in Northern California, you know, I'm eight years old or whatever, and we're all meeting and watching this. And then we're watching Buck Rogers and the 21st, in the 25th century. And then we're watching um, Battlestar Galactica. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of it just grew and grew and grew. And it took a while between Star Trek and I'm trying to remember if it was Battlestar Galactica or what the next one was. Space it's about, 1999. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Or, or secret. I can't remember which one, but it, people had to meet because you weren't going to get it anywhere else. Yeah. You had comic books. And so you would talk about comic books when you were together. And you would talk about the books that you'd read. And, oh, if you're a Star Trek fan, you'd love ABCD. You'd love Brandon Sanderson. You'd love whatever it is. So that becomes, unfortunately, ignored by the studios, except for Paramount. Paramount did not ignore their fan base once they understood what was going on. The really? Star Trek the Star Trek fan base, CBS, Paramount. And that's yeah. because Gene Roddenberry knew what was going on. He Mm -hmm. understood because he was a fan himself of sci-fi. He talks about his sources that he loved. He would go to some of these meetings, these get togethers, and that he brought back to the meetings at CBS and Paramount, et cetera. And Mm. Paramount understood probably earlier than any other studio, what it meant. And they've, they've gone through, um, they've gone through people in charge and management 
who don't pay as much of attention. Mm. But at that point they did. And that's what brought it into, I wouldn't say mainstream attention, but at least people were aware of it and you could Mm. get the word out and you could meet. So, you know, it's, it all goes back to, to wanting to talk about what you love, wanting to talk about your passion, wanting to talk about this show or this book or this graphic novel or this film series or franchise and fandom for a long time, except for some very specific narrow silos was ignored by studios was not Mm. included in its marketing or its production or its content or its feedback. They were kind of treated as, Ooh, well, that's that comic-con group. That's that geek group. Mm. Like I said, except for some of the star Trek people at Paramount and CBS studios and IP owners could care less about fans. But now, now, because they can monetize it now. Well, I think it's a couple of things. One of the things that I found is I'm going to be 60 this year and I can be considered or I consider myself to be Gen X. And so I'm looking at a a huge swath of people in charge that are my age Mm. or our generation. I would say at least 50% to 75% are geeks that are in charge of Mm. studios, production companies, you know, whether or not, you know, you're Reese Witherspoon, who is a romance and literature geek, or you're Kevin Feige and you're a Marvel, every Marvel comic book that he's read since he was a kid. Mm. Both of these people are very aware of the fandoms that exist for those properties that they're producing. Mm. And so what started, I would say, so my background continued in entertainment and in production I would say it was probably around 2000, no, late 90s, late 90s. I was working in digital and it's when I I discovered that there was a way to marry my geek fanaticism, my craziness for sci-fi fantasy and my career, which was Mm. digital production and content. So there weren't a lot of us at all. And what's grown is you start to connect as any industry has relationships. And so you build relationships because I was out there on my own going to cons because I love it. And then I was building relationships internally at studios and IP owners and production companies, finding like-minded people. And I wasn't the only one. There were other people, obviously, uh, Bettina Sherrick and a couple of others that were working within the studios or the agencies, the digital agencies. TVGLA, um, Dimitri and Brian Pettigrew are two that are One of the earliest ones, as well as um, I would say, Sean Johnson, all of these guys knew Mm. that we had something. And so you pursue it, you pitch for it, you say, we're going to connect you with your fandom and you should create content exclusively for this fandom. And then you go to the Um, fandom and you say, we've got something for you that's exclusive. Will you guarantee that you will go put butts in seats and that you'll go do this? And that's how we started Fascinating. So you've worked with Star Wars, James Bond, Predator franchise, Stargate, the Allen franchise, the the whole Whedon verse, and yeah. And so I just I, I'm sure you've got stories for each one of those. I, I I like them all. But so you go to them and you 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 like you just said you propose this kind of verbal commitment to this fan base that will give you certain property and certain assets that Mm -hmm. you like in exchange for watching in exchange for exactly or doing it's also where influencers came from is i I mean there's beauty and fashion absolutely and food Mm -hmm. but in terms of entertainment it came out of the sci-fi geek sci-fi fantasy geek area really because you've got what we would call ambassadors. I mean, that's what we called them. We, it wasn't influencers per se, because we weren't, we weren't necessarily looking early on for someone who had a lot of followers. We were looking for someone who was a super fan, someone who really, really wanted to talk and be part of and be involved in this IP that they love. So if, whether or not you're talking Harry Potter or because Julie Ryan over at Warner Brothers and Bettina Sherrick, they were involved in the fandom for Harry Potter. And I worked with them over at Fox And they said that was one of the the most fulfilling jobs they've ever had because being able to connect the content and do exclusive content for these fans who then would go on their blogs or their, you know, at the time blogs were much, much 
um, I guess, a leading influencer uh, medium, they would talk about it and they would say, oh my gosh, we got this exclusive content. We were on set. We got a chance to get a peek at this character development. Hmm. And it became, it started, it's weird. It started as a content, became a marketing cog, unfortunately. And now we're back to, okay, it doesn't have to be one of these things. It doesn't have to be all of these things. There is a a prevailing feeling now for those of us who do this, that you go where the fan is. So if that's email or content or their blogs or social media or events or PR or talent or all of those things, that's what you need to find. Where's your audience? And this is true. I mean, this is just marketing 101. Where's your audience? It took a while, but that's what we're applying in any kind of fandom development is where are they? Don't ask them to come to you. Don't be arrogant. Don't be the studio that says we're going to build it and they will come. That just doesn't fly anymore. So when you engage in the Star Wars franchise, do they say to you, uh, go go to this watering hole because that's where the fans are and do this and that? Or do you just say, look, increase our fandom and you do it the way you need to? Yeah, the latter one. Now, Star Wars was a little bit different. Working with Lucasfilm was amazing because they had a they had just started a creative story group internally when I started working with them in 2001. And that was brilliant. And that was, um, I'm, I'm blanking on his name. His name is Pablo, but he started Wikipedia. And then Lucasfilm hired him because they were wow. smart. And they and Bonnie Burton, who had written a bunch of Star Wars stories, and they brought her internally to run all of the social. They probably, better than anybody super early on outside of Star Trek, understood as a production company, not a distribution, but as a production company, we need to work with fans. Doesn't mean that you have to be in fan service when you're writing all your stories, but you do have to listen to them. What worked, what didn't? Did you mm. like this? Did you not like this direction? Did you like what we did on the audiobooks or the books or the part of the canon? All of that becomes very crucial and it's an immediate focus group. Test focus groups don't give you a lot, but your right. fandom gives you in depth if you're paying attention, if you're listening. Mm. So to go back to your question, what would usually happen if we talked, I was working for Fox and MGM, they would come to me and say, here's what's coming out and where are the fans go forth and prosper. And then I would have to hire an agency, a digital agency, a social agency. These were early days, so they were nascent. Sometimes it would just be putting together our own team internally. And then you had to do an analysis. Who was out there? Where were they? How many of them? Is this worth it? And how much money is it going to cost the studio or the IP owner, the production company, Lucasfilm, to create content specifically for them? And so you, would, you it was a blast. You'd come up, when I still do it, you come up with a campaign and you talk about where are the milestones of content? How is this going to further the story? Sometimes we would do a supplement or a bridge story that was not in the film, but it would help till the next film or the next series or the next season. So we did that with 24. It was just, it's really fun to come up with all of this and you have all your agencies come and give you ideas and say, hey, we've done some analysis, we've done this work. And then you, this is the part where I, I left the studios to go consult full time because this is where I found there to be a gap. At that point, they did the campaign. You have your six week or six month or three month window of the campaign and the outreach and then you're done and it's off a cliff and there's no maintenance there's no sustainability and those fans were getting screwed and so eventually in 2015 what i realized is there's an opportunity here for me to help ip owners and studios hopefully see the light that building a relationship just like you would do with crm and email or anything else this is no different. And if you're hmm. going to do that, it doesn't cost a lot of money, but you do have to keep community managers if it's a big franchise. So Bond, Aliens, Predators, Avatar, but hmm. we're not there yet. There's still a gap. And it's it's not that they don't get it. I think 
almost everybody understands it. Like we were talking earlier, there's tons of people internally at IP owners, studios, production companies who are fans themselves or geeks and understand it, but they aren't willing to spend the money mm. or they're not willing to spend the time. And that's, that's really my drumbeat tagline is that you've got to spend the time with fans and you have to understand where they are, why they're there, and what about your franchise, your IP that you own, are they fanatics about? Mm. So when they're getting feedback and kind of creating these focus groups, these fandom focus groups, has there been a point where there's been such an objection that they actually stop production and change the direction of stories? Has there been that much of a change based on feedback? No, I, at least not in anything that I've been involved in. However, we have Stargate in particular, we have run into, and Star Wars, we have run into storylines that the fans were not happy about were mm. in the following we adjust it. So it didn't stop production. Although I will say there was a couple at, in Stargate that were the other way around, that it was such an, uh, a raising voices of wanting to see something. So the perfect example is Dr. Beckett dies in Stargate Atlantis. And Paul McGillian, who was the actor, there was an enormous push for him to come back. And so they wrote him back. They brought him back. Wow. Um, the same thing happened with the show Joshua where they sent in the, but they're called peanuts, you know, the stuffing peanuts. And so they sent just hundreds of thousands of boxes of peanuts to the studio. And so the studio came back and I was working with them at the time and they said, okay, we're going to finish the story. Wow. So that, that happens. It's unusual, or at least there might be one that I don't know about, or I don't remember, but not in anything I've worked out where the fan outcry actually shifted during production, mm. what a storyline was. And that can clash with, uh, I mean, writers have a certain direction. You always hear about these movies. I, I, I don't want to pick on anybody. Just recently, I remember hearing about Quentin Tarantino and Janko and Chain, and Will Smith wanted to change it to a love story, you know? Right. And, uh, and he said, absolutely not. It's not going to happen. So, I mean, what happens when the fandom, you know, will, will the writers get, you know, upset about, about right. collisions there where they want to go in a certain directions and the fans don't? It's, it really is difficult. So if you look at Ant-Man Quantumania is a perfect yeah. example. Uh, you had writers who really wanted to go in one, or actually let's go to Doctor Strange in the Multiverse. So of madness, you had writers initially who really wanted to go in a particular direction. When WandaVision and other Disney plus streaming were very popular, mm. the powers that be, and I, I don't know if it was Kevin Feige, to be honest. I just know that internally there was pressure to, to add in, like to fold in in a recipe, storylines from Disney Plus streaming, or some of those streaming ones. And then COVID happens. So the initial writer left, and he, or director, who had done the first one. And he said, A, I'm not going to write to a deadline, but... Then the following writers, and this is no criticism of them because it was a decision by committee, you had fans who really wanted to see more of WandaVision, loved that, wanted to see more of Wanda. She was already in the story, but her mm. part of that story became really the conflict where that was not the initial idea. And so, and certainly it doesn't follow the book per se either. I mean, it does and it doesn't. You know, you've got Wanda has her own book story and Doctor Strange in the Multiverse has his own, which brings in all the characters, but not quite to that point. So now you've got essentially a recipe where you've taken everything that was in the refrigerator and thrown it in and hope it turns out okay. That was something that was the writers desperately trying to say, no, here's the story we need to keep to. Here's what we should be doing. Here's what the plan is. Stick to the plan People from above and the fans had in a lot of input on that. And the powers that be said, oh, my God, the fans loved this. We need to bring it in. Wow. Not that it wasn't a successful movie. I mean, I think it was $1.8 or something like that yeah. worldwide. But in terms of for the fans, it was not successful. There were parts that they loved and parts that were okay. <laughs> that happened. It just, it is... 
it is a it is a very fine line to walk and it is something that i work on with fandoms a lot is that there is an entitlement in fandoms now mm. that didn't exist before because they know they're being heard and so you have to really walk a fine line with fan groups at events and what i try to tell the ip owners is the best way to do that is be transparent be mm. honest don't try to tell the fans something that you think is going to go over and make an excuse for what's going on. Just be honest. Feige was very honest about what was going on with Dr. Strange. Fans weren't thrilled about it, but they still went to go see the movie. Mm. So you, you give them credit for, they were fairly transparent about what was going on. They're being fairly transparent about replacing Jonathan Majors. They're trying to be very honest about here's what's going on. Here's what's going on in production and we'll do the best we can where I think Kathleen Kennedy stumbled with Star Wars is that she should never have been announcing movies that weren't for sure going to happen. Mm. So, you know, there a Ryan Johnson trilogy, a Taika Waititi trilogy. These aren't currently on deck, but they were announced as if they were. And to their credit, COVID screwed everybody up. But instead of just coming back and saying, okay, no, these aren't going to happen. They just kept saying, oh no, we it's going to happen. And that star Wars celebration post COVID was kind of a mess. Mm. And I had a lot of friends who were on stage and behind the scenes who said fans were very confused. This star Wars celebration in London, one, two, three, got it. Wow. This is what's going to be finished. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're doing it. Let me introduce to you the people who have that vision. And you have to give a lot of credit to Dave Filoni and John Favreau for pulling those threads together. And those are two with Pablo, who's um, head of the creative story group at Lucasfilm for paying attention to the fans. You don't have to do a fan service that throws everything in a big stew that doesn't work. In um, The Mandalorian, they brought in Zeb from Star Wars Rebels. Fan service also ties to the story that's now gonna happen in Ahsoka. Cool. Star Wars Rebels is, you know, a perfect way to pull that in character. It's a fan service. All the fans go, oh, my God, that's great. Me included. There's them. <laughs> but it didn't blow the story. It was still in line with the storyline. It didn't feel like you were forcing a square peg in a round hole. And that's a really tight line to work for people on both sides. You mentioned that the fans become entitled because... What happens when there's trolls that, you know, that, that may not be the majority, but the, does a squeaky wheel, you know, get the yeah. grease? I've worked with studios on both sides where they pay attention or they ignore mm. it. The ones that have paid attention and gave it legs, it, it inevitably comes back and bites you on the ass. There's just, mm. there's no way to pay attention to that or to respond to that and have it work out well for you. Let, if you've got a strong enough fan base, let the fans themselves corral those trolls and put them. Now, Star Wars had all kinds, as we all know, lots of toxicity issues during COVID and still do, but here we are coming out the other end and the fans for the most part, eventually responded to those trolls and pushed them back. Hmm. It doesn't do anybody any good to respond to the insane amount of, I don't like it. I like it. it, it it's going to be all over the place. I mean, the, you know, the Marvels had really, really, really great reviews on the trailers and teasers for anybody who had gotten a sneak peek. The minute it goes online, you have all the trolls going crazy mm -hmm. about, you know, it's, it's woke and it's, three women and we don't want this. Okay. So don't go see it. Mm. And that's where Marvel has worked very, very hard to wall off that kind of response. It's, it is unfortunate that that can sometimes skew your rotten tomatoes or your score mm. or your or your box office initial up, you know, the upfronts that you look at so that you're looking at what's trending. In other words, we haven't released this, but it's already got bad negative reviews. 
at that point, yeah, you have to do something to try to stem that tide. My problem is a lot of times it's like chicken with a head cut off. Okay, let's go do this and this, and we'll just mm. show more of the movie. No, just go to your fans that are positive about it, that you've screened, that you've sneak previewed with, that are looking forward to it, that are holding back judgment and ask them to come forward, ask them to do more. Because it's it doesn't matter what review site you're on. It's always going to be the people who loved it and the people who hated it. Mm. Everybody in between is not going to bother putting up a review. They could care less. They've either gone to see it and loved it or they hate it and or they're just meh. <laughs> It doesn't do any good. And this is where I have to work with fans, where I have to say, you've got to be vocal online as much as the people who don't like it. If you really like it, even if you've got, hey, this, I didn't like this part, you have to go talk about that. You can't just be the laid back kickback. And then when you hate it, you talk about it. Right. That has a really negative impact on the content and on the writers, because there's writers who and directors who don't ever want to do it again. And that's unfortunate because there's some really talented people who have basically told Lucasfilm and Paramount and others in these huge franchises, it's too much. I can't deal. Hmm. And then we have the fandom, like the geopolitical and a cancel culture. Like you, there was Chinese base and one of the Marvel movies changed the right. gender from male to female. And then right. the, the, the one in Mandalorian there, Gina, I forget her first name said something and she was canceled and she was removed right. from the show. I mean, where does fandom fit into those, those kinds of portrayals? Well, that gets very messy yeah. because you have internal decisions that have to be made on is what Gina Carano said, going to have an impact on our fandom, on right. our audiences. And they do very, very quick research to see, is this just something that's going to blow over and it's a seven day wonder, or is this something that's going to have legs and people are really going to be pissed about it? Which is why you see sometimes they wait because everything is clickbait. Everything mm. has to be, you know, did she really say this? And then you see some studios knee jerk overreact and then have to walk it back. So for fans, what's hard as a fandom audience is for them, they've gotten smarter a lot is who's the source? Where'd you read it? Has it been verified? Has it been backed up by more than one source? Most fandoms mm -hmm. as a group are doing much better at, we don't swallow this whole, we check it out. We want to see like with Jonathan Majors, is this really something we need to worry about? Is this something we should? And when it was, then the fandom said, we're really not comfortable with this. And that's what they told Feige in their outreach is innocent until proven guilty, but we're not comfortable with this. And so then Feige has to really look at, at okay, innocent until proven guilty versus court of public opinion. And that's, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation. That's really tough for fandoms. It's tough for IP owners. I tend to feel worse for IP owners in those cases because they have to make multiple decisions on their bottom line, the court of public mm -hmm. opinion, which are the people who are buying their shows, buying their movies. And sometimes they have to make a decision that isn't fair. And they'll, and they acknowledge internally, it's not fair, but it's a business. And if there is one thing that the sci-fi fantasy geek fandom is extremely opinionated. And so <laughs> And that's where the entitlement, you have to be careful and walk a line. With Stargate, we had it a lot. You know, it's it's one of the best fandoms. Buffy was one of the best fandoms I've ever worked with. Ironically, Bond is one of the best fandoms I've wow. ever worked with. Really? All of them from, for radically different reasons. And those three are the least entitled that I've ever worked with. But you still have those moments where they think, well, we deserve better than this. Well, that may be true. <laughs> You may deserve better than what you're getting, but this is what you're getting. And either you have to support this or there won't be anything else. So this may not be the best show or the best movie or the best character development that you wanted. It may not match the graphic novel. It may not match Ian Fleming's books exactly, but we need you to support this or there won't be more. And that's, that's a, that is a tricky conversation. And I've had to do those. I mean, flat out just had to do that. And, wow. 
you know, I, I will get in arguments. It's the running joke for people with me is that I am more likely to have the argument with the IP owner than the fandom, because I'm going to be much more supportive of the fandom in the long run. And I try to be balanced because that's my job. But the one thing that I always try to tell the IP owners, like I said earlier, is just be transparent with the fans. Mm. And if you can't tell them, tell them you can't tell them. Can't tell them. Yeah. And don't, don't try to pull the wool over their eyes. Definitely don't do some song and dance. They're smart enough. Most fans want to know what's behind the curtain. They love to know about production and the writers and how did it get there? And what's that machine that you're doing that's, that's this development? They want to know, how did you go from this graphic novel or this idea that you just pulled out of nowhere to this beautiful film or this series? They mm. really love that now. That didn't used to be the case. So they're not stupid. Don't underestimate your fandom by trying to tell them, look over here while we're changing everything over here. That's a very dangerous, and it will lead to entitlement. The, tour, the term universe has really broken out into these films and into these series now. We have you know, uh, Breaking Bad universe where there's you right. know, Better Call Saul and there's all these kinds of things that came from it. And uh, right. we saw in Succession that just ended 2.9 right. million people watch the finale of and Succession. They're, and they're going to have a Succession universe show that of they're course, developing. You've got Yellowstone and, you Yellowstone, know. Yellowstone, another yeah. one, yeah. So is there fandoms for each of those universes as well? Yeah. Oh, absolutely, be. absolutely. And it's, and again, I think that that's why Taylor Sheridan was very careful when he was doing his to look at, all right, we have this, I mean, people went crazy for Yellowstone and mm. he already had these ideas. And one of the reasons, it, and I can't remember if it was a, um, an ACA interview, but, or a TCA interview, but he was doing an interview with Paley Center and he talked about, he's always had this idea because he's of the age where doing that kind of universe in an IP makes sense mm. you can sell something not as a one-off as a universe if you can prove that there's a fan base there mm. so he already was thinking i want to do this i want to start with 1883 1923 1963 this is how i want to do this but i have to do the first one mm. so here's my pitch for the first one and here's how this is going to work then he looks at the audience and the fandom and he shifts some of his ideas for the other universe shows based on what the fans liked the best. So mm. there's someone who had his, his finger on the pulse and paid attention. And he had people who developed a relationship with those fandoms online, digitally, in person. And then you've got, you know, Faith Hill and Tim McGraw, because they were in music and understood it, could take the, that input and got it. Mm. They absolutely understood what they were doing and who they were doing it for. Because outside of sports, I don't think anybody is better at fandom than musicians. Wow. And they either fail or they, or they get it. But, mm. you know, BTS is the perfect example of a marketing machine to their fandom. It's not just about that the fans love their music and these very cute guys. It's, okay, we get it. We're paying attention and we're talking to you fan in the United States that loves these guys. Mm. Taylor Sheridan did the same thing. Before we got in, we talked about technology. You were introduced to it, you know, through digitally in, in 86, I believe you said, and I'm, you know, I, I uh, taught myself a bunch of languages then mm -hmm. as well. Uh, we kind of came at a different angles, but video games has a big entry to yeah. this as well. And their fandom, we're seeing them turning into movies. We're just seeing a big, huge base. I mean, video, video game industries must be trillions of dollar industry. It is. And it's, and I worked and I I'm working again with video games. I worked in video games, digital content and digital production and digital marketing in the late nineties through about 2007. Then I took a break because it's mm. a little intense. Um, but now I'm back in it. Um, I'm working with a couple of people um, that are writers and producers on video games and video games are really interesting. So we're of the age where we loved video games. We played in a video arcade. Yes. We might have had something at home that, you know, was Pong or Pac-Man or something like that um, or Nintendo um, early on. 
And video game fandom is fascinating. I've done a, I did a whole panel. They existed on their own. Chugging along could care less about everybody else. If the oh. entertainment industry or the um, economic industry looked at them, they didn't care. Hmm. They were going to do what they did. And it was started by people who were fans. So every single solitary game that you see, except for a few, are started by people who were video game fans in the first place. Wow. And they thought it was cool. I mean, the guys who are at Atari, Nintendo, these were geeks who loved the, the technology of it, but loved the story of it too. Loved the, the, the silliness sure. or, or the depth of it. I got to work mm -hmm. on Myst when it first came out and those guys could not have been more up my alley for geeks. They loved really? storytelling. They wanted it to be engaging. They paid attention to their fan base. Red Orb paid attention to other games and what worked and what didn't. And that's what they put into that. And then they had and hired developers who really knew how to push the envelope on the technology, on the programming and development end. That was, again, just kind of existing on their own. They Nobody really paid attention to them. They're chugging along. Suddenly it becomes available to everybody that it's a billion dollar industry. And that was probably mm. in 99, 2000. Tech crashes, video games keep going. Right. Video game almost industry, I think, had, I can't remember, because like I said, I did a panel, but it was something super slight in the crash. Maybe an 8% drop. I mean, it was wow. insane. Because it didn't really affect them. Again, they were very insular to everything else that was going on. So <laughs> then the entertainment industry goes, ha, huh, look at you guys. You're doing some really cool stuff and you succeeded when all of the rest of us were trying to do things with technology and didn't get it. So then they start paying attention. And that's when EA really exploded was in probably 2000, 2001. I mean, they were already mm. popular. They were already a multi-million dollar business, but that's when they really came into their own and they said, I think we got this corner. I think we get this. And then you get Red Dead Redemption, you get Grand mm -hmm. Theft Auto in the 2000s. And, and that's that fandom, unfortunately, is extremely tough. Really? It's very toxic in some areas. Hmm. It is and can be one of the most sustaining, amazing, fun get together where it's not just online, it's in real life. You can have mm. obviously multiplayer games where you're with everybody. It has the ability to connect people worldwide. Like I don't think anything else, but you also get because of this insularness that happened, you get a lot of groups who are very resentful and unfortunately very toxic and gatekeeping about whether or not you're a fan, whether you're you, you're not a fan, we don't think you're a fan. Hmm. And and I am extremely progressive, but the there is a bit of indoctrination that happens within certain groups. Really, and it is not healthy. Hmm. So I'm very careful about this conversation because it's very easy for people to take it to an extreme and say, it's the reason why we have fill in the blank, but it's not that. It has more to do with the fact that you have people who have other issues and they deep dive and then it becomes their life. Because like I said, it's very insular and you're connected to groups of like-minded people and you're in a game together and it doesn't matter what game you're in. It could be a first person shooter or it could be Final Fantasy. It doesn't matter what type of game it is, but if you're in this insular group and you're in this very, very tight echo chamber, then it can get really toxic. And I think that, that that's where we all, at least in my industry, we have to work very, very hard across each of these fandoms to make sure that we shine a light in those dark corners so that that doesn't become something that unfortunately could kill some of these IPs. And and 
can some of the problem there be the anonymity of the players, right? Because they oh, can't absolutely. Use that's the issue, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. So remember, and we're we're early technology when you had AL chat rooms, AOL chat right. rooms, and we had the same problems, and we had predators, and we had issues, and there were, you know, a lot of um, Oklahoma bombing was, you know, right. it, there was a lot of things that were found within those dark corners, right? And we've got dark net, which exists. And part of this is that if you've got someone who is maybe on the fence and they fall in with a group that is anonymous, that is pushing certain ideologies, it's happening a lot in video games. However, having said that, the flip side of that coin is that you have groups who don't have support in real life, who don't have live someplace that is anti-LGBTQIA or misogynistic or, you know, unfortunately, um, maybe anti-immigration, whatever it is, mm. a lot of these, these people and these groups are being able to find like-minded groups in video games and in fandoms where you're supported and lifted up. And I can't tell you the number of times I've seen it over and over and over again in Star Wars, Star Trek, Stargate, Bond, Aliens, Predator, Buffy, especially Buffy, where you mm. see the fandom lift up a a person or a group of people who were struggling for whatever reason, whether it's discrimination or against your particular group or race, and they've been lifted up because they found a tribe that, that supports them. And that's the good flip side of that coin. And I, I see more of that than I see the other. By far, I wouldn't be in this business if that wasn't what I was being able to see. It's it's a passion that you get to see so much at every event or online to see the connections that happen with all of these fans together. It creates an amazing feeling of joy. Mm. Yeah, we can't let the the minority bring us down, right? Exactly. I mean, it, yeah, it's it's overwhelming. Most people uh, are good intentioned and mean well. Uh, you know, so we talked about, you know, technology. I started my firm in the 90s and, you know, I was working long, hard days. We know this both as, as business mm -hmm. owners, but yeah. I wasn't paying, yeah, 16 hour days and <laughs> was not paying attention to my eating habits. And I, mm -hmm. you know, before you know it, I was 340 pounds. The doctor said to me, you know, I'm not going to see my daughter graduate mm -hmm. unless I lose the weight. So, and by the way, she graduated Cal State last May, right? A little. Oh, North congratulations. Yeah, yeah, she did. Yeah. Northridge. And, um, so then, uh, I took the next year and a half to, to lose the weight. So I lost about 130 pounds. People always ask me how. And Jenny, as you know, I just say discipline, right? There's no right. magic bullet. You just got to work right. hard and change things. Uh, so I wonder how discipline plays a role in your life. Well, obviously for a consultant, which is what I am and which I have been since 2004, it's it has to be woven into what you do. So... I started working from home in 2000, well, actually 2002. So you cannot work from home without having some discipline yeah. in your process. What my, I guess my thing is what I try to tell people is if you're going to do this, you have to be passionate about what you're doing and, or mm -hmm. you have to find something that is worth that goal. So you found, okay, I want to see my daughter graduate. That's but right. you have to find that goal that makes, that brings joy, that brings you that passion, or you're already passionate about it, or the discipline is not pot that this is my opinion. It's not possible wow. because if you don't find hmm. that way that is encouraging you, that is cheerleading internally for you to reach that goal, the discipline is just a tool. That's it's just a tool that's going to fall by the wayside and it's, and it can change. That's the other thing. B, I've had to be very, very forgiving of myself in that my job changes. And so the discipline that worked for something pre-COVID doesn't really work for what I'm doing right now at all. And so you have to change it and not, not sit there and get upset that you didn't reach that goal or do that thing. It's like, well, okay. And don't say, oh, I want to get back to 
this. No, 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 no. It's, it's whatever it is right now is what's happening. You're not going to go backwards. You're not going to go back to normal. Mm. That was normal then. That was your discipline. That was your process then. What's your goal now? And it could be multiple goals. And so then you say, okay, this is how I'm going to reach this goal. And it might be a hard goal. Losing weight is a hard goal. I mean, I've had to do it because of hip and back things. And I don't want to be, you know, basically they were saying, I love to hike. And they were saying, well, you'll, you won't hike in five years. So, oh, okay, cool. I've got to do it. So that's my goal. So I have a picture of this five mile hike that we used to love. And that's what keeps me going. And I do my exercises and I do it for my job, for everything. It's a little easier for me, I think, than other people, because I get to do what I'm passionate about, what I'm geeky about. So I'm working right now with a sci-fi author, a sci-fi fantasy author. She's an award winner. So it's really cool for me because every time I need to do something, even if it's tedious or administrative, it's towards this goal of I get to do this amazing campaign for her for nine, 10 months. This is really cool. I get to do this. I keep that in my mind. Yeah. You have to find that passion for me. It was kind of a, you know, the term come to Jesus moment, right? The Mm -hmm. thought of me not seeing my daughter was enough for me to make a life change. Not a, not a, not a quick convenient change and then gain it, gain everything back. I just, I got myself to this point and now I'm going to change it. It, You got to kind of have that moment where you're able to turn it around like that. Absolutely. And that's what you mean by, by passion. Uh, it's, it's very, very true. Um, Jenny, Jenny seven, what motivates you? I know a lot of people say this, but finding joy Mm. motivates me. It just does. I like to laugh. I married someone who makes me laugh. I have a kid who I am just absolutely adore and I have fun with. And not everything is going to bring you joy, but that's what motivates me to keep going through the hard times is that I want to be with people. I want to bring joy to fandoms. I want to bring joy to my family. I want to be able to enjoy myself being with those communities. Um, I think in general, that's my motivation. The, the result is that I get to find these communities, whether it's a family or a found family or a fandom family, it's pretty cool. And Mm. it keeps me really motivated to keep going. If I'm feeling frustrated with a particular fandom, I go to an event because the minute you meet with somebody and you see how much they love it, you can literally live off of that joy that they're wow. showing. Wow. Yeah. The, I've seen the passion of some of those fans and uh, boy, they just get so much happiness. I remember specifically Harry Potter. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, my daughters were, we would go to the, the movies and, uh, they wanted to wait out for the books at one point. And yeah, it's just, um, that must be very rewarding. How do you measure success, Jenny? Oh, success for me is, again, I, I don't mean it to sound like a cliche. I, I don't care about whether or not my business is successful or that I someone asked me the other day, why didn't you accept a job at Fox that would have been, you know, like an SVP type job? Because I didn't care about the position. I cared about what I was doing. Mm. So success in general for me has more to do with if I'm having fun, then I'm doing it right. If I'm not, then I need to step back and look at what I'm not doing right. And that's a motto that my husband, who we met in school at college, like I said, he makes me laugh. And that's his motto is that if you're not having fun, then you're not doing it right. And then, and he doesn't mean that we've had to slog through some pretty tough times, like everybody has, but the success or the, the measure of that is not some artificial 
did I make this job or did we have this house? It's, are we happy? Are we supporting each other? Is our child happy? Is our family in a good place? And are we there for them? That's, did I do a good job of supporting my family and my husband and my son? That's my success. And then in my business, did I do a good job of supporting the fandoms? Did I do a good job of building a relationship with them? Such a... and, did, and did I have fun? And did we have fun? Yeah. Did we have a good time? Yeah, all too often uh, people are measuring things by money, by possessions, etc. But if you don't have family, you don't have friends, you don't have happiness, it's really going to be short lived. It is. And it's and it's not to take away from the struggles. I'm very blessed. I don't take it for granted. The struggles that we had made the quote unquote success when we came out the other side together that much sweeter. So it doesn't mean that every aspect is going to be spot on or that you're going to get it right every time. I laugh all the time that, you know, I get it wrong more often than I get it right. But as long as I'm batting 300, I'm cool. It's, okay. it's good. So I, I think for a lot of people that there's an over focus on where they are in the career. I don't want to say money because it's hard to not have that be important when it's how you pay for your food, how you pay for your child. But in terms of where they are in their career or where they are in their life, there's an artificial goal that has to be met to be successful in America. And I think that it's extremely undermining and pressure that is unfortunate on anybody. It, it has to be. And I don't know how we get that message out there more is do you love where you are, what you're doing in any manner, shape or form? If you are at McDonald's and, you know, I've done it, I've done the food service and, and it's not a lot of fun. Yes. But the one thing I enjoyed was interacting with the people. OK, so that's what I focused on. The rest of it, not so much. Mm. But that I loved. I mean, I. All of us, especially in the entertainment industry, have done ridiculously stupid, awful jobs. And I mean, I had to work in an accounting firm as an assistant, and I cannot tell you how much I hated that. And it was mm. cog in a machine. It was a huge place. But the people I worked with were some of the most fun people I've ever had, some of which are still my friends. So it, I hope that that is something that we can all start doing more of. I don't know. It seems wonderful, Jenny. And you said you were working with an author now that's on three books. Tell me about that. Okay. So SG Blaze and it's the Luminian or Seven Galaxies franchise. She is amazing. She just won some awards this past summer. Yay, SG. So what we're doing is we're working with them to take, because she's self-published and she's she already got out there with three books and wow. worked, her team was her and her husband and an assistant. They just talk about working hard, but she loves it and she loves what she does. And so what they've done now is they want to take it up a step. They want to take this up a notch. They want to grow their fandom, their audience. And so I'm getting to work with them. And I think it's, I think I sent you, it's sgblaze.net, I think. But if you just look up Seven Galaxies or Last Luminian, L-U-M-E-N-I-A-N. It's uh, She's got three books out. Her fourth will be out in December. And we're going to be at three cons. And we're going to be doing live events on her Facebook group, her authors group, and her TikTok. So it'll be a lot of fun this summer. We're going to be doing a lot of stuff. Very cool. Well, Jenny, it was so great talking to you. I'm so glad we had this uh, chance to talk. I, I enjoyed learning about you. I enjoyed talking to you. I can't wait to see what's uh, in, f in the future. If anybody wanted to get in touch with you, how can we? So the best way to get in touch with me is via email, Clio Consulting, C-L-I-O Consulting at gmail.com or via LinkedIn, which I'm Jenny Steiben on LinkedIn. Those are the best ways to get a hold of me. I answer everything. J-E-N-N-Y-S-T-I-V-E-N. -E -E I'll make sure to put it in the show notes. 
Jenny, thank you so much for your time. When uh, next time I'm in the San Diego area, we'll go and get a cup of coffee with you and your uh, oh, husband and show me around a little bit. It'll be great. We would love it. Come out for Comic Con. It'd be a blast. That's and Joe, right. thank you so much. It's always fun to talk about geek stuff. I love it. Obviously, I absolutely love it. You'd be so well. I'll talk to you soon, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you for listening and or viewing Joey Pins Discipline Conversations. Please share this episode with one or two of your friends who you think may benefit from the episode. Our website, www.joeypins.com. There you find lots of resources and you could join our mailing list. Please follow us on all our social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Podcast information, the video version of our podcast is on YouTube. Please subscribe. Audio is on all major podcasting platforms. Please follow them. And if you like it, please consider giving five-star rating. We'd really appreciate that. Would you like to financially support the podcast? You can go to our Patreon site. Consider five, ten, or twenty dollars a month. There's all kind of plans that we have there. It's like a one-time payment. What is this podcast episode worth to you? You be the judge. You can go to our PayPal account to do that as well. Thank you again for listening or watching Joey Pins Discipline Conversations.